Live Christ, Church International USA. VOP gonna take you old school. Woo! I got a question. Are there any soldiers out there? Yeah. <laughs> well, help us sing. Let's go. I'm a soldier. In the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. In the army. I'm a soldier.
I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it may be in whatever part of the world this broadcast work of faith finds you. We welcome you to the Body of Christ Church International USA live stream service on this Super Sunday service. Praise God. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the word for the day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his precious and redeeming blood, your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into the truth and who brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said. Father, it is with great joy, unspeakable and full of glory, that we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. We welcome and invite your supernatural manifestations, demonstrations, illuminations, and revelations into this service. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thanks to our music, worship, and arts department, who always faithfully usher us into the presence of God and to prepare our hearts for the spoken word. Let's turn in our Bibles today to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to begin reading at the first verse. It says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, I want you to note this. Take this inventory here. Men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Wow, what an inventory of issues and challenges. And you know, to be honest with you, after going over that inventory, you don't have to go very far. Whatever today's date is, whatever this year is, you're there. This inventory definitely accounts for much of the activity that we are witnessing in the times in which we are living. So the question is, what do we do now that we know this, that we understand this? Because Jesus unfolded many issues of the times in which we're living in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel. In fact, I'd like to go there as well. Let's take a look at that. And again, that first passage we just went over, that was 2 Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 through 3. So uh, let's go over to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> and here in the fourth verse, well, first I'll start in the third verse, okay? As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? This was a legitimate question, and I know it's legitimate because Jesus provides an answer. And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed. That means watch out now. You know, take notice, pay attention here. Take heed that no man deceive you. Now, Jesus is not just simply talking about preachers, false teachers, false apostles, false prophets, or false any of the ministry gifts, although they would be included in this inventory. He's just saying, take heed that no man deceive you. And when he says no man, it's not just the masculine gender here. He's saying don't let anyone with human sources of information deceive you. So it could be a man or a woman saying things. And if you're listening to them and you're assigning value to them, that may be contradictory to what the word of God teaches. Uh, he's telling you caution here. Don't let anyone deceive you. And why? For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. Now, the word Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which means the anointed one. And so he's saying, many will come, notice, in my name, saying, I am the anointed one, or I am an anointed one. And, and listen, and through this process, he said, they shall deceive many. 
there. That's deep. He said, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. There are two primary directives that Jesus says to us. He says, number one, see that no man deceive us. Secondly, he said, see that you be not troubled. Don't be anxious. Don't, don't go into depression. Don't become frustrated. In other words, don't allow your emotions to go into a negative discharging state. Amen. And there's good reason for that, because Jesus also told us in John 16, 33, he said, now in the world, you will have tribulation. There'll be trouble, disturbance and so forth. But he said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Praise God. So I want to go into these verses because, again, a question we want to answer in our session during this Super Sunday is what, what do we do now? We've been warned about all these things coming. I mean, look at this laundry list or this inventory in 2 Timothy 3 that talks about the characteristics and the nature of men uh, in these times in which we're living. It, it, it begins and ends with displaced love. Lovers, it says they're lovers of their own selves, and then it ends up with lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. But that, that's the natural result. When you become a lover of your own self, which is self-centeredness, when you get to that point, it's easy to love other things other than God. It says lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And really what you're doing is you're looking for things to fill yourself in. Because when you become a lover of yourself, but not a lover of God, not a lover of the people of God, so forth and so on, you create a vacuum. And nature abhors a vacuum. Nature hates a vacuum. And so before you know it, you're trying to find ways to fill yourself up with substantive things, with useful information or experiences, and yet they leave you still with this empty feeling. God is the only one who can fill those places and fill those spaces in our lives that essentially leave us unsatisfied, confused, and in many cases, just flat out angry. So what do we do now since Jesus is saying we're in this time of the beginning of sorrows? He also said, you know, as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, he said, so shall it be when the Son of Man returns or when Jesus returns. So these are very interesting things. And in Matthew 24, he says, many will come in my name saying I'm Christ and shall deceive many. And he said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We're in the middle of all that right now. He said, but in spite of all that, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Remember, the question of the disciples to Jesus was, what is the sign of your coming? When comes the end of the world and so forth? And so Jesus is giving them an answer. Now he goes on to say in verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation. We see that. Kingdom against kingdom. We see that also. And there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All of that is happening now in real time. And he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. But it gets more intense because Jesus goes on in verse 9. And he says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, that dynamic in these last times that Jesus is speaking of is in process. It is in progress, even as we speak. Yes, in this year, 2024, th these things are unfolding, unpacking, and showing themselves. He said, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow or wax cold. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Now I want you to notice something here. That when all of this drama, this violence, this 
anachronistic outlook happens that Jesus describes here in verse 9. It leads to verse 10. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Why? Because people are going to have trouble distinguishing whose friend or whose foe. And this will be a very challenging season in the lives of people, not only for Christians, but also the people of the world, the people that are not directly or necessarily following Jesus. So what exactly do we do now? Well, there's a few things I want to put before you. There are some principles I want to share with you that may help you as a believer sustain your spiritual center of gravity. Now, you know, listen, the world's being turned upside down. Uh, what's good is be, being called evil, and what's evil is being called good. And all of this is trickling right out to our entire society and our entire culture. So you're going to have a mix of people on, on one side of the ledger that are just ballistic. They'll do anything, say anything, act any way, do any way. And then on the other side of the ledger, you will have the true followers of Jesus who are determined to do that which is right in the sight of the Lord and to be obedient to God's word. But here are a few principles that will help you sustain your spiritual center of gravity and assist you through this particularly challenged season in which a strong presence of deception and delusion are at work. See, that's why Jesus said, first, take heed that no man deceive you. Don't fall for tricks. Don't fall for traps. There's so much deception, so much delusion. You hear these cases where people lose their entire life savings and other benefits and uh, assets that they have because of scam artists, people pretending to be who they're not and convincing individuals that they have something to offer them that's better than what they already have. In essence, it's almost like, let's make a deal. <laughs> would you like to have what's in box number one or what's in box number two? Or would you have what's behind curtain number three? This is what's going on. The devil is making all of these deals. Yes, he's the one that's saying, let's make a deal. And that's exactly what those kinds of scenarios are. And I hear reports about, you know, uh, uh, elderly people who have saved up all their lives. They have their nest egg or retirement funds and things like that. And along comes a scam artist and tricks them and dupes them out of it. And they're getting more and more technical also. They'll do it through your laptop. They'll do it through your tablets. They'll do it through your phone. And so, you know, we need to be on guard. Jesus said, take heed. It means pay attention so that we know what's going on around us. So this is very important. Number one, never allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. Never allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. Now, the Bible speaks of good success, and you'll find that. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It says this, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Amen. And then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. So here in Joshua 1 and 8, it speaks of good success. So is there not a countermeasure to that? Would there not be, if there's good success, then there must be bad success. In other words, people are attaining or achieving success but it is not good success. Now, this phrase, good success, has to do with dealing wisely in the affairs of life. If you can deal wisely in the affairs of life, it stands to reason that you could also deal unwisely in the affairs of life. So what's important and the point we're making is never allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Everything that glitters is not God. So what, again, never allow the world to entice you into accepting its standards of success. Number two, never seek the world's approval. 
never seek the world's approval. Let's go to Luke's gospel and uh, we'll look at chapter 16. Luke's gospel, chapter 16. And we'll look at verse 15 to uh, study out this particular point. Again, Luke 16 and 15. And here's what it says. He said to them, you are they which justify yourselves before men. Now, he was talking to the Pharisees uh, who the Bible described as covetous. Amen. And, and they were deriding Jesus. He said, we don't want to hear his doctrine. We don't, don't buy into him. Don't buy into this. But they're the ones. So he said, he said, you are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Now catch that. He says, what is, this is Jesus speaking. He said, what is highly esteemed among men, amen, is abomination in the sight of God. Men are coming up with all kinds of new tricks and wickedness and evil and all these kinds of things. And they're communicating on the threefold level, spirit, word, and gesture. And again, they don't, they really don't want to fall into line with what God's saying. He's saying, you know, they're esteeming things that God calls an abomination. That's why the culture has devolved to the degree that it has right now. All of the things that make absolutely no sense, all of the things that are fostering confusion into our society, uh, into our nation, into our cities and towns and our schools and all of our marketplace and whatnot, because there's some strange, strange things that are permeating in all of those areas. And they are changing the face of the cultural landscape. And some people are wondering what in the world is going on? What has happened in our country? What's going on with our children? What's, what's happening in this day and time? And uh, so Jesus is just sort of giving you the heads up. I want to read that one more time. Again, that's Luke's gospel, chapter 16 and verse 15. He said to them, You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Amen. So very important that we not seek the world's approval. Amen. Then here's another thing. We'll take you back to Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 23. That ought to be easy to remember. Proverbs 23 and 23. And what does it say here? It says, buy the truth and sell it not. Amen. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. He's not saying buy anything that is measurable in human metrics. You know, nothing by the pound, nothing by the linear foot, uh, nothing of three dimensionality to it. He's telling you, buy the truth, invest in the truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now we could take this literally, if there's an opportunity, there's a seminar, there's a forum or something that is what I'll call faith-based and is about to instruct you or train you in something relevant to your lifestyle and something that can also improve your lifestyle in Jesus. Well, you know, buy the truth and sell it not. That's a worthy investment. That's something worth going into. Uh, But there's a lot of things that are not. But the scripture warns us to buy the truth and sell it not. So you have to sort of put everything up against the truth. And if it can't stand up against the truth, you don't need it. Get rid of it. Praise God. All right. So there we have it. Buy the truth and sell it not. Now, So what do we do now? How do we live? What's going on here with all this drama? Well, understand that even as we live and as we speak, there are definite signs of the times. And I want to go over these with you just a few moments and share some other insights as well. Number one, we are experiencing the compression of time. The compression of time. It seems like we don't have the time to do the things that we need to do. We feel pressured. We feel compressed. 
the compression of time. That is a true sign of the time. Secondly, the acceleration of activity. People are just coming and going everywhere and almost at a frantic pace. It's almost uh, people say, well, I can't wait till the day, after, uh, you know, the day after tomorrow, so let me go ahead and put something up the day before yesterday so I'll be ready for the day after tomorrow, the acceleration of activity. We also have the magnification, the magnification or the enlarging of personality. We see that in TV. We see that in the motion picture industry. We see that in virtually every, any platform of entertainment, the magnification of personality. Fourth, the increase in the intensity of living. Now, this is a little bit different from the acceleration of activity. When it says the increase in the intensity of living, you're already engaged in something, but there's an increase in the intensity. And listen, these things weigh on you. They're not necessarily adding anything to you, but in fact, they tend to draw energy away from you. Number five is the deterioration of character, a sure sign of the times, the deterioration of character. Now, when someone is integral or has integrity, they are whole, they are sound. But if, you know, there's something loose in that structure and whatnot, that is not good. The deterioration of character. Amen. Number six, the emasculation of manhood. Uh, there's discussions everywhere about the role that men play in the world, and manhood is a part of that, but it's almost as if they're being drowned out, as if those terms are becoming archaic and not any longer used to describe some of these very important and critical points, the emasculation of manhood. And then you have number seven, and we're seeing signs of this all the time, the erasure of standards, the erasure of standards. Uh, for example, we're seeing that in, in school systems, for example, they're trying to purge the honors uh, classes out or the advanced placement courses and classes out. Why? Because everyone is heading toward this, what I call, equity arrangement. That means everybody, no matter what their prerequisite, at the end of the day, they want everybody to have the same outcome. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, if you study, if you're ready, even if God has gifted you and given you insight in an area and you're working hard, you could very well become one of the leads. You could become one of the master performers or technicians or whatever it may be, if it's the field of medicine or the field of law or the field of engineering. If everybody is just dealt with on the same scale, there, even Sears has better sense than this. They sell you products that they call good, better, and best. Even the Bible says, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's spectrum there. There's a scope there. Amen. You, you can't force everybody through one funnel and, and have the same outcome. People are different. People are individuals. And it seems, you see, remember, there, there's, we have a mortal enemy. His name is Satan, and he hates the image of God. And every time he sees one of us, I'm talking about a human being, he's reminded that we're made in the image and after the likeness of God and that we represent who and all that God is. At least in, I'm just saying from a physical appearance standpoint. Now, it goes deeper than that because you have to get into the heart of a person and where their thinking is and so forth to really determine whether or not that person is living up to the level of God's expectations. But the emasculation of, of, of manhood uh, or the deterioration of character, I was talking about that, but the emasculation of manhood. I know what it was. I was talking about the erasure of standards. I beg your pardon. Just got my little numbers mixed up here. Uh, the erasure of standards. Again, let everybody just come in, give them all a passing grade, let them go. Now, you have to ask yourself this question. If you're in the marketplace out there, forget the marketplace, you're at home, and perhaps you have a medical emergency or something comes up or your child is sick or whatever and so forth. And, of course, I always encourage people, lay hands on people, pray the prayer of faith, amen, uh, anoint them with all, and believe God for his healing virtue and power to flow. But if that doesn't come in the prescribed time that 
it needs to manifest itself, then what are you going to do? You say, well, I'm going to take him to the doctor. I'm going to take him to the hospital. Okay, well, the doctor is not as, shall I say, as good or as skilled or as craft worthy as he should be because he was forced, for the most part, not to challenge himself, not to go beyond the basics and explore and discover ways and means by which he can improve his skills, he or she can improve their skills or develop understanding to minister to the needs of those who may be sick, diseased, and or infirm. And the question I'm asking you is, do you want mediocrity working on you or do you want excellence at work in your life? And this goes for any discipline. This goes at any level, any level, engineering, uh, law, medicine, dentistry, manufacturing, I mean, you name it, retail, whatever it is, are you going to accept the erasure of standards? In other words, to make it, quote, fair and equitable for everybody. Nobody's going to fail out of this school. They're all going to get a passing grade, but it's a shame if they come out of that school and they have no basic understanding of communications. They cannot read. They cannot write. They have no oral speaking skills. They can't do arithmetic. That is not an ideal scenario because those three things, I call it reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's an old school expression. But those are the basic foundations and fundamental building blocks one would need to begin to learn and increase their, their scope of understanding moving forward in their lives. Praise the Lord. So we don't want the erasure of standards because that puts everybody at risk. If you have an engineer that can't even put the Tinker Toy set together, I mean, how are they going to build a real bridge over which tons and tons of automobile equipment and trains crossing over uh, trestles or track or whatever? And uh, they say, well, this engineer just cut some corners here, right? And then, and then the bridge comes down, somewhat similar to what happened recently here. Now, that's not the same thing exactly. That bridge was pretty well engineered. It had been there for quite a while since the 70s. I'm talking about the bridge up there in Baltimore, the uh, Scott Key Bridge, okay? And, and so, but it came down when a, a ship hit one of the underpinnings of it, and boom, it just crumpled down like a matchsticks. And it was gone. Now, I'm not here to judge the architectural or the engineering um, uh, acumen of those who constructed that bridge. But nevertheless, they're going to do a full investigation to determine if that had anything to do with it. You know, I, you would think that maybe one little piece would kind of come loose and that could, of course, compromise the whole bridge. But my goodness, for the, the whole structure and the whole span to just crumple down as if it was nothing. Reminds me of a little Jenga game where you stack up the blocks, you know, and you try not to let the little tower fall over. And that's, that's kind of what it looked like there. But, you know, they'll determine whether or not there was an erasure of standards because any time an accident in the public square takes place, whether it's a, a, a boat wreck, a train wreck, an airplane wreck, they always want to go in and investigate to find out who is at fault. And it may be a what, but then they're going to want to ask who put the what there that failed. So what are they looking for? They're, they're tracing standards of measure. So they don't want the erasure of standards. Number eight, the perversion of principles. Now, now this is where people, I'll just be honest with you, take principles, for example, that come out of the scripture, and then they attempt to twist them they attempt to pervert them. They attempt to uh, twist them around to what the Bible describes it as calling good evil and calling evil good, or what's called the perversion of principles. Number nine, the hardening of hearts. I'm just talking about signs of the times, and then we're going to answer the question, what do we do now because of all these things? Should we just withdraw? Shall we retire? Shall we just go away somewhere and forget it? Shall we go to our vacation home? up in the mountains, down in the valley, out on the desert somewhere. No, you don't have to do that, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a moment. But the hardening of hearts. People's hearts are becoming more and more ballistic. They're losing patience. They're losing tolerance more and more and more. Uh, people are fighting over it. You know, it's like the wild, wild west out on the interstate highway. Not too long ago, I saw a video where 
two truckers, I think, were shooting at each other over, over ongoing traffic. You got other lanes of traffic out there, and one trucker's over on the right side and another trucker's on the left side, and they're firing out of the window at each other. Some altercation must have occurred that, you know, provoked all of that drama and foolishness. And that is foolishness because it puts everybody at risk out there. If any one of those truck drivers had been hit, wounded, or, you know, rendered unconscious, it wasn't only going to be the ruin of that 18-wheeler, it was going to be the ruin of many other people out there on that road since he's unable to seize control of his vehicle and bring it to a safe stop. So it, this is the hardening of hearts. People are not even concerned or considering the benefit and the well-being of other people. And it's getting easier and easier and easier to choose that kind of a disposition. disposition. Don't be a person like that. Don't allow your heart to become hardened. And people's hearts are getting hardened because they're disappointed. They're, they're uh, not making their ends meet. They're living in frustration. They're living in uncertainty. And it's creating pressure on them. They're under tremendous stress. And consequently, their hearts get hardened because they say, well, look at these other people that are not doing right. Looks like they're gaining an advantage. They're making money, this, that, and the other. Why, why should I not do that instead of playing by the rules. Well, see, when you get to talking like that, watch out, your heart is getting hard. And then finally, the rise of the worship of evil. The rise of the worship of evil. Yes, that is going on right now. You say the worship of evil? Yes, absolutely. There are people that are not satisfied. They're not, it, nothing appeals to them uh, without it being evil. And so they want more evil, more wickedness and whatnot because it seems like it's fun. Well, even the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. The challenge there is that the pleasure is seasonal. In other words, it's not going to last forever. But see, what God does in your life lasts forever. What the devil does in your life or what demons usher into your life uh, is unpleasant at the very least. It is the rise of the worship of evil. And these are the signs of the times. So what do we do now? I'll tell you what we do now and follow along with me here. Number one, we do what the Bible says. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4 that we should be praying for those that are in authority, all that are in authority. We need to pray for our own leaders. Yes, our city leaders, our county leaders, the leader of the state who is the governor. We need to pray for the president of the United States, pray for our congressmen and our senators. We need to pray for the judicial branch of government, the Supreme Court justices, the head justice, and all the other associate justices. What should we do now? We should be praying for these and for all that are in authority. Amen. Praise God. Number two. You need to trust God. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. There is an absolute access to God right there. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will will direct your path. Number three, maintain your joy. Maintain your joy. There's a lot of things that are competing, I should say, to try to rob you of your joy. And the joy of the Lord is your strength. So you don't want to be weakened. But there's some people that get so caught up in various circumstances and situations in their life that they, they, they have you know, no context about the joy of the Lord. Amen. So we, we got to do that as well. Praise God. Amen and amen. So we pray for the authorities. Do what the Bible says. Pray for all men is specifically what it says. Trust God. And then notice this. It says maintain your joy. Maintain your joy. I just got through saying that the joy of the Lord is your strength. It is important that you maintain your joy. And number four, walk by faith. Walk by faith and not by sight. Glory to God. Finally, number five, live in the love of God. Beloved, mm, 
Love ye one another. Let's, let's go to 1 John chapter 4. Because these are important things. What do we do now? These are the things that we do practically. Number one, pray for all men, all that are in authority particularly. Amen. Avoid getting caught up about how things appear. This and the steps to follow are all acts, really, of self-discipline. You have to discipline yourself to do these things that I'm telling you about right here. Amen. Now, we're turning to 1 John chapter 4 because I wanted to touch on this principle uh, about living in the love of God. So we'll go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8. Here it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's just a fancy word. He's the one that removed and took away all of our sins and all the impact of them as well. So these are the things that we do now. Praise God. Number one, you need to know that God always deals with the specific and the general. He can deal with both the snapshot. I like to say that's every individual. But God can also, he also has a scope and a grip on the big picture. So that, that goes from your, your local house, your local neighborhood, to the county, to the state, to the nation, and the nations of the world. So none of it is overwhelming to God. Praise the Lord. Those are the things that we do. This is what we do in these crisis times, in these difficult and challenging seasons. Praise God. Well, I tell you what, thank God for his word. Thank God for his spirit and his anointing. And uh, it's a good time right now to pray. Why don't you join us now as we go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. Whoever you are, wherever you are, pray this prayer with us right now and say, Dear God, in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer today with us, congratulations and welcome into the family of God. You are now officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And we want to help you in your new life in Christ. So we have something we've prepared especially for you. It's a free gift, absolutely free. Yours simply upon request. It's called the New Believer's Kit. And it's yours, as I said, simply by request. There's two ways you can order yours. Number one, send us an email to our email address, victory at bocciusa.org. Once again, that's victory at bocciusa.org. Or you may phone us at 678-607-7729. Once again, that number to call, 678-607-7729. In either case, please leave your full name and a good mailing address so that we can get your new Believer's Kit right on the way to you. Don't delay. Do it today. Praise God. Well, that said, it's offering time here on the Body of Christ Church International USA live stream. Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Praise God. There's three ways you can engage in the economic system of the kingdom of heaven right through this ministry. Number one, go to our website at bocciusa.org. Secondly, you can text to give. You text it on your phone. Text the letters B-O-C-C-I to the number 28950. Simply follow the prompts and in seconds 
your contribution will be registered. Praise the Lord. Thirdly, you can mail in your tithes and or offerings to our post office box address. And uh, I'm going to pull that graphic back up on the screen in just a moment or two. But first of all, let's pray. Father, thank you for the joy, privilege, and honor it is to worship you through the bringing of tithes, the giving of offerings, and special offerings. We honor you with our substance and with the first fruits of all of our increase. So shall our barns be filled with plenty, and our presses shall burst out with new wine. As we give, it shall be given to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that we meet with all, it shall be measured to us again. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, may the Lord richly bless you as you so faithfully, generously, and cheerfully give. I'll be back. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for your generous offerings of support and for your continued and faithful tithing. Father, we thank you for the integrity of your word. As the people have given now, according to your word, we believe they receive the corresponding return upon their giving and in the world to come, life everlasting. Your blessing makes rich and adds no sorrow unto it. Father, as we continue and maintain covenant with you, the devourer is rebuked for our sakes. He will not destroy the fruits of our ground. Neither shall our vines cast forth their fruit before their time in the field. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken, declaring us to be a blessed and delightsome land. Father, we thank you. The needs of this ministry and the needs of your people are met exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. According to the power that works in us in Jesus' name, amen. Men and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, friends, it's Super Sunday, and you know what that means. It means we're going to partake of the communion table or the Lord's Supper. So I want you to take a moment right now. If you haven't already done so, those of you who are usually with us on the Super Sunday service know we're going to partake of the communion table. Well, get some unleavened bread. Grab you some fruit of the vine. We use grape juice here. Praise the Lord. And an unleavened wafer. Praise God. But nevertheless, these are the elements of the communion table. And uh, as is our custom, I'd like to go over and invite you to please join us in reading in unison from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 32, which basically tell us what the communion is all about and why we do it. It tells us what the communion is or the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper, and why we do it. So without further delay, let us read. I'm going to read from the King James translation, and certainly you can follow along in any translation you wish. So we'll begin reading again 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at the 23rd verse. It reads as follows. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. <clears throat> after the same manner also, he took the cup after, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, uh, pardon me, drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So this passage informs us of what the communion is, what the Last Supper, that's what it's referred to in the Bible, uh, that Jesus had with his disciples before, of course, his uh, crucifixion and so forth. So this tells us what it is and why we do it. 
And we can do it again and again and again because Jesus said for as often as you do this, we just happen to do it on our broadcast schedule on the first Sunday night of each calendar month. But you can, quote, have a spiritual meal ready to eat with the Lord anytime you so choose. That's why he said, as often as you do it, he just said, be sure you do it in remembrance of me. Well, in that same night that Jesus was betrayed, he did take bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said to them, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us eat. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink. Well, praise the Lord. We believe here in our ministry that those that partake of the communion elements receive a great blessing and invoke the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus into your body. I believe that God will usher in and sustain and maintain the fearfully and wonderfully made standard into your physical body. In every cell, in every tissue, in every bone, every organ, in every system of your body, receive the healing virtue right now to flow from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, to your fingertips and to the tips of your very toes. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I tell you what, it has been a great joy, a great blessing, an honor and a privilege to come into your place of viewing and listening with the everlasting gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And until our next appointed time of assembly, I want to remind you as always to continue to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. God bless you. We love you. See you next time. For free information to help you understand what it means to be born again, please contact us at the Body of Christ Church International USA, Post Office Box 490346, College Park, Georgia 30349, or by email victory at org, or by phone 678-607-7729. Simply request a new Christian kit and we'll send it to you free and postage paid to your home. May God bless you as you feed your faith and starve your doubts to death.